All righty. My name is Mia Sims Washington, and I am the Director of Digital Programming and Events for Walker's Legacy, and I am pleased to serve as your moderator this morning. Uh, named in honor of Madam C.J. Walker, Walker's Legacy was created with the mission to cultivate an ecosystem of access designed to inspire, equip, and engage a global network of professional and entrepreneurial women of color. You can learn more about Walker's Legacy by joining us online at www.walkerslegacy.com. The Cowork and Connect virtual morning chat series is aimed to learn the best practices for remote work, the importance of mentoring, staying sharp while staying in, financial planning for small businesses, and self-care routine tips during this time of quarantine and social distancing. So let's get started with today's program. It's my pleasure to welcome our guest today, Erica St. Bernard. Erica is a licensed clinical marriage and family therapist and founder of Your Life's Well LLC, a private practice in Bowie, Maryland, where she sees millennial women and men to include couples preparing them for life and love that prioritizes their wellness. She provides pre-engagement, premarital and couples counseling to prepare and empower couples for a legacy of love and wellness. As an ordained minister, she integrates faith and spirituality at the request of clients. Erica seeks to normalize conversations about mental and emotional wellness and the intersection of faith for and with people of color. Please help me welcome Erica St. Bernard. Good morning. Good morning. I'm super excited to be here. Let me see. I can't see you yet. There we are. I just got the prompt. There we are. There we go. Good <laughs> yes. morning. It's good to good see you. Good morning. Too. Good to see you as well. Good to be here. <laughs> well, we're so glad to have you. And I understand that you are going to start us off today with something a little special. So I'm going to move away. I am. I am. Thanks so much for take, giving me the floor. So yes, I want us to turn our attention just for a moment. I want us to first acknowledge that we're here, that we're in this space together virtually, right, from wherever we are. And I want to invite you to do this activity with me. It's called a guided exercise of meditation and breathing. Um, and so I'd like, you to, I'd like to invite you to settle into your space, wherever you may be and allow your body to soften as you feel the chair that's supporting you. You may press the soles of your feet onto the floor and rest your hands on your lap or on your legs, or you may allow them to fall down by your sides. In this moment, I invite you to close your eyes or to soften your gaze to the floor or to an inanimate object. With your eyes closed or your gaze lowered, I invite you to take a deep breath in through your nose holding it for a count of four, three, two, one, and exhale through your mouth. Once more, a deep breath in through your nose. Hold for a count of four, three, two, one, exhale. Now I invite you to consider what you need most in this moment. Maybe it's joy or peace or strength or focus. Maybe it's self-compassion or courage. Whatever it is, in this next breath, inhale deeply through your nose what you need or want, and exhale. Now this time, consider what you want or need to release. And as you inhale, inhale what you need and exhale what you don't or what you'd like to release. For the release, maybe it's confusion or self-doubt or imposter syndrome or fear or insecurity or frustration. Maybe it's feeling overwhelmed. Maybe it's rage at the times. Whatever it is, exhale that. For the next three breaths, I invite you to inhale what you need and exhale what you'd like to release. Inhale what you need. Exhale what you'd like to release. Once more, inhale peace and exhale distraction. As we close this guided exercise, I invite you to give yourself permission 
to be fully present in this space at this time as we share what it means to channel our pain into gain and as we navigate our lives as women of color who seek to do great and amazing things. When you're ready, feel free to open your eyes or return your gaze or attention to the space you occupy. Thank you. Oh, that was lovely. Great. Yeah. Yeah, Did sometimes we just running, running, running. It's like, wait, yeah. we're here. Let's just be need here. A moment. Yes. Just need a moment. So thank you for, for you sharing are that welcome. with us. And sure. That's something sure. that people can easily do mm -hmm. every day at home. So, mm -hmm. well, um, we love to hear the journey. How did mm -hmm. you get to be where you are? There's always a story. There's always a journey. And we would love to hear yours. Sure. So I was originally a preschool teacher and planned to own and operate a preschool. That's what, that was my dream for as long as I remember. And in doing that work, I found that it was rewarding, but I found that my children struggled. And it was not an academic struggle, but it was a social and emotional struggle. And I wondered what I could do that might be helpful. And so I began praying and I asked God to show me what I could do. Long story short, um, I went to my husband and I moved to Florida and I did a, well, I went to an open house for a marriage and family therapy program. And it was like the sky opened up and all the birds were singing, this is what you're supposed to do. This is the thing. And so I applied on site, got admitted on site and everything was, everything's history from there. So I still do a bit of teaching kind of in the work that I'm able to do, but it's a great marriage, if you will, great intersection of my love for family and then my ability to support couples and families. The other piece of that story of how I came to be an entrepreneur in this field is that my husband and I did premarital counseling 15 years ago. It'll be 15 years tomorrow that we celebrate. Um, 15 years ago when we did premarital counseling, we were graced, graced with a Black premarital counselor, but she was not a marriage and family therapist. And so I realized that I loved the work that she was doing and I said, I want to do this. I want to prepare couples for longevity. Um, and I'm grateful for that investment that we made then. But what I noticed is as I was looking at the landscape of marriage and family therapists, there were very few people of color. And I thought there are tons of social workers who are Black, there are tons of professional counselors who are Black, there are even some psychologists who are Black, but there were so few marriage and family therapists, and I wanted to be a part of that change. I wanted to shift that so that when people were looking at a directory for therapists, particularly mar marriage and family therapists, that they could see Black women in particular. And so that was what kind of got me got the ball rolling in that direction. Um, and so I worked in private practice, I worked in some agencies, and then decided with the push of my husband, <laughs> literally a push, I launched my practice three years ago uh, in January. And it has been amazing to be able to be my own boss, set my own hours, create my own schedule, and certainly in the life of quarantine, to re-navigate things and kind of settle again into a virtual space with clients has been such a joy. Mm. That's wonderful. Um, there is still this stigma mm -hmm. around mental health, around counseling. Um, I know it's starting to soften, but it is mm -hmm. still very prevalent. I've just run into conversations with people where mm -hmm. it's come up and it's still this, mm -hmm. this stigma. Why do you think that is and mm -hmm. How do we do? We just continue to chip away at it till it becomes our norm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, it is still a stigma for a number of reasons. Um, I think some of it is that we don't know what we don't know, and we don't know the power of therapy because people don't talk about it. Right? I go to see a therapist. I have friends who see a therapist, and we laugh and talk together about our therapists, our sessions. Not so much the details, but just that I'm so grateful I have a therapist because I might have gone off today. I might have popped off. I might have said something and wrong, <laughs> all those things that could happen. But because we have a safe space outside of family and outside of friends, we can process those things. So I think it's not knowing what we don't know. We don't know what we don't know. And so we make assumptions or assessments. Other times it's because we've heard of people's poor experiences. I'll never forget the first time I had a client call me um, and I answered the phone as is typical because I'm a one woman show. And um, she was bawling and I'm, I waited, I said, can I help you? And she said, I'm, I'm just so excited somebody answered the phone. I've been calling therapists for weeks and leaving messages and nobody has returned my call and nobody has answered the phone and I was about to give up. 
And so we were able to talk through that. But I think about the times that people have reached out for support and not been well received. Sometimes they asked a friend or family member what they could do for support. And instead of offering therapy or suggesting it, there was no conversation. So I think there's some of that. I think the other piece is certainly lack of representation. Again, if you look at some directories, depending on what you're, if you're trying to use your insurance or if you're just looking in your region or area, it can look pretty lily white. And so if you are wanting somebody who has more, uh, is more likely to have an experience that is similar to yours, because that doesn't suggest that because they're brown skin or black that they will have an experience like yours, but the likelihood that their existence in the world is more compatible to yours is, is greater in that regard. And so sometimes there's a lack of representation, a lack of access, because we talk about insurance or where we live and how feasible it is. Certainly now that things are virtual, that is not such a barrier, but for some, even this virtual platform for therapy feels like a, absolutely not. So got to think about that. The other piece, I think, and I left this for last because it is so steeped in stuff is like our family history. We have stuff and we were gro growing up, they told us, you know, keep the home business at home. You don't talk about your business outside. And so a lot of clients, even when they make their way into therapy, have a hard time kind of leaning into the process because they're hearing big mama and auntie say, don't tell nobody our business, keep business at home. And so working through that. And then the very last thing I would notice, sometimes it's the religious community that is not quite on board with the alliance and the allegiance and the um, compatibility of all parts of our bodies, right? So we are mind, body, soul, and spirit. And so if we're only speaking about praying or reading your word and those kinds of things, I tell my clients, you can, I have a t-shirt and a sweater and a pillow that says you can pray and see a therapist at the same time. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that includes medication if medication is required. And so this idea that we really can integrate all of those aspects of who we are, we don't have to pick and choose. You can be a God-fearing man or woman and struggle with anxiety or depression or something else. And so I think it's really important. You talk about how do we chip away at it. I think we keep talking about it. We keep having conversations and forums like this, but also in our living rooms, on our own personal Zoom calls, on our Zoom happy hours, on our connections with our friends. We just keep talking about mental health. We keep talking about what it is to have additional support. And that is how we slowly over time knock down the stigma. And then certainly we support initiatives that will and you know uh, continue to foster the value of mental health. We go to workshops, we show up, we get some training, we do all the things we can to make sure at least the people closest to us know that we are a resource and an ally for mental health support so that we can live well, because that's the goal. That's really good. Um, you know, I see a therapist as well. Um, you know, and I, I was telling you yesterday that, you know, I've shared with my daughter, daughter, your mental health, your emotional well-being is your responsibility. When you get to a certain age and things happen to you in life sometimes where you need somebody to walk you through it. It's not a sign of weakness. You're not a punk, but you just really need someone. And I tell you, when you get in that space in that vein and you find it you look forward to it it's like oh good thank god i got counseling on thursday i can go ahead and tell her mm -hmm. everything that's going on um Absolutely. and you leave lighter mm -hmm. and um mm -hmm. you find out things about yourself that you never knew and things that it's like oh i do this because of this and i didn't realize this was associated with mm -hmm. how i was raised and how i felt that you bring that into your adulthood. Absolutely, absolutely. So. It's a beautiful place. And that's the thing I think I, I tell clients, I commend your courage for reaching out for support because I do realize in making that first phone call as a therapist to find a therapist, I was like, oh my gosh, I'm doing it. I'm dialing the number. Oh my gosh, they answer. What do I say, right? And I'm like, you're a clinician. Calm yourself and say what you need to say. But again, that stigma, that whole thing, what does this mean that I need support? It means that you desire to maintain your wellness. You go to the gym, you see a trainer. You go to the doctor, you see a medical professional. You go, if you need glasses, you go get glasses. I wear contacts. If you need your hair done, some of us go to a professional. Like we have professionals who assist us in all these other spaces. And so a part of the way to, you know, destigmatize mental health is to make sure we're talking about the people in our lives who are supportive. And many times that can come in the form of a clinician because that person is unbiased maintains confidentiality so you never hear your stuff in the street you never hear your stuff in the barber shop or the hair salon or anywhere you go because we are bound by the limits of confidentiality and so it's one of the most amazing spaces i think i'm biased though but i do yeah. agree it is it's wonderful it's, it's a wonderful thing it and, and it unlocks things in you that you just don't know and you're able to to soar it's it's really a beautiful beautiful thing 
Um, I think that's the other piece. People don't realize that you unlock the soaring parts of you. I think people think yeah. only about the ugly stuff that they've been trying to hide in a closet and tuck away. But then as you suggested, you find that, wait, I've had wings all along and I do know how to fly, right? In whatever way we're seeking to soar. So thank you for pointing that out. Yes, that's fabulous. Um, I'm going to let people know if you have any questions, just put them in the chat while we continue to talk. But please, if you have questions, please ask. Um, this was entitled Turning Your Pain Into Gain. Uh, there's a lot of pain happening right now. Uh, a lot of pain, a lot of distress, a lot of, there's a lot of emotion. So can you uh, divulge into that a little more about how do we have I think maybe some people are overwhelmed that I do. I have all this hurt. I have all this pain. And how can I turn this around to mm -hmm. where it works for me? Mm -hmm. Sure. It's a great question. I think one of the first things is to acknowledge that we're in pain. So often we are trying to be the strong Black woman who doesn't crack, who doesn't break, who isn't burdened, who isn't looking like she's stressed and overwhelmed. And I'm not suggesting that we should go to work and fall apart. No, don't do that on the Zoom call. But I am suggesting that it's important for us to acknowledge that something doesn't feel right. I'm not feeling okay. I'm feeling overwhelmed or I'm feeling enraged. I've got big feelings for big reasons. I think it's important to acknowledge what we're feeling and to name it. Sometimes I'll have clients and I even have friends who say, I'm feeling some kind of way. And I'm saying, I say to them, well, let's explore what that kind of way is. What is the feeling? What are the words connected to that? Because when we name it, it, it lessens the power that those feelings have over us because we've called them out. And so if I'm feeling disappointed, if I'm feeling enraged about the climate that I'm living in, if I'm feeling perplexed about the fact that I'm not really sure what the next six months are going to look like, and I had some plans and dreams and visions for 2020, as most of us did, we just kind of identify what those things are. And then we can, after we've identified them, we can begin to find resources to work through those things. So certainly the guided meditation is not a fix, certainly, but it is a space where we can, once we've identified the feelings, give ourselves a moment to kind of sit in the present moment and process what we feel. I tell my clients, we have to feel all the feelings. We can't just feel the happy ones and the really good ones and the ones on the heels of excitement and on the ones on the ends of the promotion or the raise or, you know, doing the next big thing. But it is feeling the moments of defeat and acknowledging that in this moment, I feel like the wind has been knocked out of me. And then to remind yourself that I've not been here always. And so that suggests that I won't be here always. I can get out of this. And so after we acknowledge it and we name it, I think it's important to connect within community with people that we know love and care about us and who can support us. But then also honestly this is not even just a, a plug for therapy but like connect with a therapist because in this space and in this time we are managing whatever life was dealing to us before 2020 came and then we're managing all of that is in the media so concerning black and brown lives then we are managing all that is inclusive of quarantine and living in these bubbles and trying to manage life here we've gone from personal interaction to zoom interactions which are totally different even though we know the people on the other end of the screen it's not the same and so we're managing like a super conundrum of of, of difficulties <laughs> just like it's an overwhelming space and again the beauty of therapy is that it gives us an outlet it gives us a space to as my client says to wusa, to take a deep breath kind of like women who go home and take off their bra and they sling it it's like this space that I can be free and I can just let it let everything fall where it does and I'm not concerned about it and so I think that's important to make sure that we are also taking care of wellness in other ways making sure we're sleeping and I know for some of us who are entrepreneurs, it feels like sleep is the last thing we have time for. But I promise you, and I don't, often, I don't use the word promise often, the better we sleep, the better we work. Our bodies are really wired for sleep. Like we need rest. So when our bodies are tired, go to bed. I know you got more stuff to do. Set an alarm, get a nap, get up and finish the stuff. But if we continue to keep pushing and pushing and pushing, literally we push ourselves into a corner and that's where we can have major psychiatric crisis or issues. Psychotic breaks happen in this space where we've not been resting, we've not been eating well, we've not been tending to ourselves, all because we've got this work to do. A friend of mine just wrote an article, um, something about um, grind culture is not going to save us. We have to be intentional to pull back. And I know we want to do well and excel, and we will. And rest will be a part of that. So I think it's important to, in acknowledging that there is pain, to acknowledge it, but then to figure out how we can use the energy that we had been using to push the pain away 
to use that energy to feel the pain and then to kind of, again, channel that energy into, okay, now this is what I can do to affect change in the global space, to affect change in my personal space, to affect change in my community, but really connecting with, connecting with the pain. A lot of us don't want to do that. I wrestle with that sometimes. Like, I don't want to feel that. But then I know that when I feel that and I give myself permission to, the feeling is not as overwhelming as I thought it was going to be. And it's actually more manageable. And then I'm able to get over that hurdle and get to the next thing. And as I'm doing that, I'm finding that I'm making progress and moving closer to what the goals I had in mind before. Mm-hmm. Um, that's good that you said that, you know, during this whole pandemic, uh, there's just been, I think people experience bouts of sadness. Mm-hmm. Um, just, and it, it will hit, you know, sometimes mm-hmm. it'll be tears or you'll just kind of be feeling melancholy or, mm-hmm. and it's easy to stay there but what you do need to know is that it passes it does pass you feel it but it passes Mm -hmm. um and and you need to feel Mm -hmm. it so that it can just go ahead and pass yes yep it's, it's, that's, it's that's the hard part of it. And that's what I tell clients, you know, we're in session and they they talk about a hard thing and they're ready to jump to the next thing. And I'm like, nope, let's sit with that for a moment. Mm. Let's sit with that feeling. I can see the weight on their eyes. I can see it in there. I can see them like trying not to cry. And I'm like, let's just sit in this moment together. I'm here with you and I've got time. Let's just sit and feel this for a moment. And like, I don't like this. And I was like, yeah, I know, but you'll, the more you practice it, the better you get at it. And then as you suggested, it passes so much sooner because you've made time for it. And I think we make time for fun in our lives and make time for recreation and that's good. It's also important sometimes to make time to feel all the feelings. Because when we do, we get better at feeling the feelings and then we get, you know, the turnaround time is a bit quicker, if that makes sense. So we have a couple questions. Um, One is, and you kind of spoke to it, but how does one deal with worry and uncertainty? Mm-hmm. That's a real one. Thanks for the question. Um, acknowledge that it's there. Acknowledge that um, I was talking to some therapist friends a few months ago, and we said if ever there was a time to worry, like now is it? So it makes perfect sense. You're in a pool and a sea of other people who are worrying for good reason, right? So I think about the diagnosis, kind of the diagnostic manual that speaks to all things mental health. The DSM five talks about each of these symptoms of anxiety or worry only being really problematic when they start to impact our daily function. And so know that worry on a nat- normal, kind of uh, normal in quotes, but it's natural for us to worry. Our bodies are designed to kind of ward off uncertainty and to prepare us for danger and those kinds of things. But it's problematic when we're not able to perform and do the things we need to do. And so I would say acknowledge that worry is real and then think about and find some creative resources for how to channel that energy. For some people, journaling is amazing for other people they work out for some they garden for some like me i color i love to color i buy kid coloring books i buy adult coloring books and i just love to color so it's a great opportunity to find in this season particularly ways that we can acknowledge the feelings acknowledge the worries think about what you're worrying about are the things that you're worrying about things that you have any control over if they are not then acknowledge that this is where the level of control stops for me and the rest of this i either have to kind of surrender whether it's to god or to the universe or what but i try to try not to kind of get stuck in that worry cycle when you find yourself there kind of shift your thoughts to okay what is an actionable thing i can do now sometimes that helps when we can just stop the worry acknowledge okay this is a worry it's not something i can do anything with right now and then try to pivot and change your energy to something that you can do something about whether it's again if it's go for a walk change your scenery those kinds of things can be helpful that's good because there are um there are some things out of our control when you said that it's just like we don't like that i know i don't <laughs> um but there are some things out of our control mm-hmm. that we cannot do anything about and we have to let it go. We have and I think, like you said, it's telling ourselves that. It's reminding ourselves that this is not something I can control. And I think that's even more impactful for entrepreneurs because the business is within our control. The business is the thing that we're responsible for. And so sometimes the fact that we are in business and there are things that we cannot control, we're like, what am I supposed to do? What am I supposed to do? What am I? And it's freaking us out. And so it's acknowledging that I'm doing the parts of the business that I have total control over and I'm doing those things well. And the other pieces I have to kind of surrender and acknowledge that this isn't, this is outside my wheelhouse. This is so outside what I'm able to do on my own. Yeah. Yeah. Good, good stuff. Um, Okay, what advice would you give to couples working 
towards marriage. So I'm not mm -hmm. sure if they're not married yet and going to be or are married and just working. Okay. I don't know. I would take that. Yeah, we'll, we'll just take it either way. Um, I would say great thing. It's great that you're curious and that you're inquiring about that. That's a great sign. <laughs> um, I would say kind of reach out to a therapist. Reach out and see about um, consultations. I offer consultations. Most of my colleagues do as well. We offer consultations, which is a time about 15 minutes or so for the couple to hop on a call or Zoom or video, video platform to um, kind of chat about what your challenges are, what your strengths are, and what goals you might want to set and work toward. Um, so it's a great way to kind of think through what you're wanting out of the relationship and how you're both showing up so you can make some adjustments and corrections personally or maybe relationally there are things that both of you can be doing but i think it's a great thing that it's on your radar and i think if you're interested and you're wanting more information or to talk more specifically about what you're thinking then i'm happy to be um, a resource okay what signs so when someone goes into or attempts to go into counseling they could be nervous they've never mm -hmm. done it before mm -hmm. what are what are the signs or what are the feelings that you have when you have a therapist that you know is the therapist for you? Mm, yeah, I, it's, it's great that you mentioned the anxiety because that definitely walks with us from the car into the room, right? Or maybe from the house or wherever we're leaving from to get there, but now even just logging in virtually, um, is to acknowledge that I'm anxious, that this is new. And most therapists will say upon greeting, you know, something along the lines of, I'm so happy that you're here. Thanks so much for coming, you know, and we'll acknowledge the anxiety in the room. I know this is new for you if it's your first time in therapy or if it's your re recurring, you've come back or you've seen another therapist, acknowledging that and affirming that it's okay for you to be nervous. It's okay for you to feel anxious about this. And I tell clients, you are inviting a perfect stranger into your life. That makes sense that you'd be nervous about that, right? Like, wait a minute. And I'm going to be telling her my details, not like just a person I meet at the meet at happy hour or at some other event, but this is like a person I'm going to pay money to, to listen to my story, right? And so I think of it too as an opportunity for you to, again, take ownership of this opportunity to, unlike in other relationships, to some extent, we are choosing this person. And so I tell them, you're interviewing me. The consultation call is an interview. That initial session is an interview. So if you get to the office or get on the virtual platform and something just doesn't quite feel right, like you've gotten past the initial jitters and you just feel like maybe they don't get you or maybe they're judging you or maybe they're late or maybe they seem preoccupied or maybe they're just not available. Like those are some telltale signs that I would kind of pay attention to. I had a therapist before my current therapist and she was she was decent. She was a good therapist. Um, she was older school, more like my mom. And I was like, yeah, I don't need a therapist like my mom. That was part of why I was in therapy. So I was like, yeah, I switched this up. So I met with her a few times, but there were things that I, when I got into the office, there was something that I kind of paid attention to, tuck it in the back. And so just making mental notes of those things, right? I talk, talk to my clients and I say to myself even that when we are people of faith or when we have intuitions about things, right? Spirit, spirit, no spirit. And so if something about this just doesn't seem right, then I think we need to pay attention to that. And if we're feeling confident enough to say to the therapist, hey, it just seems like maybe we're not aligned properly, or this doesn't seem like such a good fit. Therapists are usually really great about helping you connect with other clinicians. I know I am. I tell clients at the outset, if I'm not a good fit for you, I don't want you to be here unnecessarily, and you don't want to be in my presence unnecessarily. Let me know, and I'm happy to help you find a better fit for you. So I think it's about knowing what you're there for. When you have your consultation call, great questions to ask are, do you have experience and training working with fill in the blank, right? So if you're going because there's a relationship challenge, is this person trained in relationships? Because if not, they'll give you some good advice, but therapy really isn't about advice. And so you wanna make sure that you're getting, a, you're in, gonna be in a space where the person can tend to you, your wellness in a, in a full spectrum kind of way. The other question is um, certainly if you're wanting to use insurance, do you accept my insurance? Those details are important, certainly fees and times of scheduling and virtual or you know in-person, all those questions. But I really think it boils down to knowing um, what you want and then being very tuned in to, to your body, being very tuned in to your spirit or to your intuition, because your body knows, your body, there's just something, you just get a sense like, you know, you've been to a place and you're like, something about this is not right. And that can be the same even in a virtual space. You're like, yeah, this, this is not a good fit. And then being courageous enough to continue the search because that's the other thing. But you do find them. I had to, I had to work with two before I found mine, but you do find them. That's good. The other thing is ask for referrals. Your friends see therapists. 
mention that you're interested and see who in the room is like, oh, I know somebody. And even if that's not the person they go to, they may know a person who goes to that person and then you find your way to a great therapist. And if not directly to that therapist, maybe even a referral from there, that could be helpful. That's good. So listen, you know, listen when you have that feeling, you know, mm -hmm. um, and I did with my therapist, there was just, there's a, while there's anxiety, there's also mm -hmm. this comfortableness mm -hmm. that just yes. comes that, and once you just kind of ease and yeah. sit into it, you're just like, oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, feels and I've had clients say that this is the most, one client said something like, this is the most difficult yet refreshing time on my calendar. Like, she's like, when I'm coming, I'm like, oh gosh, no, I don't want to. She said, but then when I come, I'm like, this is why I come to this place, right? So it's an opportunity to, as you suggested, to face the difficult things, but then also to know that this is a space of comfort and a space of safety. I tell my clients that my space is safe and sacred because I believe that when you schedule time to sit with someone to talk about your life, that that is a sacred time. And it's safe because again, I'm not sharing your confidence with anybody else. What we talk about stays with us. And so it's a really great space in that way. Um, this is good because while you're also a therapist, this is a business for you. Mm -hmm. So it says, how did you uh, go about doing your practice? Um, where do you begin once you had your accreditation? Yes. So I have a, um, a gift and my husband, his undergrad was in business administration. And so he was super helpful, but there are tons of ways to, first thing I would say, scroll all the way back. First thing I would say is to get a notepad or some sort of book or Pinterest or get something where you can really begin to think about your niche. When I first started, I was trying to see everybody. Cause I just, you know, I was like, I'm gonna see everybody. I'm gonna work with everybody. Major mistake. <laughs> because I was burning out, because I was trying to do too much and be too many things to too many people. And so I would say from the beginning, get really clear about your niche. Get really clear about what work energizes you, what work excites you, what diagnosis is you're intentional to kind of focus with or relationship challenges that are important to you. Be really intentional to kind of drill that down because once you do that, it kind of gives legs and arms to the rest of what you do. When you start trying to see everybody, you're scattered, you're trying to then collect fragments of pieces and pieces, it's just frustrating. But to get really clear and have a, a niche space where you can really think about the age and demographics of the people you want to work with. Are they people of color? Are they not? You know, are they, um, are they low, you know, on the social economic status or are they on the higher end? Like really get clear about all those things. And then still back to the last question, pay attention to your gut because that is what helped me as I start ending. And I started with a big wide net. I was going to see everybody. And over time that dwindled, dwindled down. And I started to really pay attention to my energy level with certain clients. And I noticed that black women, I got excited. That couples, I got excited. But like children, I was like, I don't wanna do that. And certain, like if I was, I was working at one time with a workers comp thing and I was like, I don't wanna do that. And so just really paying attention to what energizes you, what feeds you, what fuels you, and allowing that to be a part of the process of planning for how you move forward. In addition to that, of course, it's consulting with other people who are in practice similar to yours. Um, you know, not just, hey, can I pick your brain? But hey, I'd like to schedule a consultation. Is there a cost associated? to ask that question because if we're in business we're not in business to just sit on the phone and have our brains picked it's great that you value what we do and we appreciate that but we also appreciate some coins yes. so <laughs> present that as an option the other thing is to seek mentorship in that same space um, and of course mentorship is a you know tricky because sometimes people say and I, I agree that there are levels to mentorship like at some point people will um, you know mentorship has it's privileges to some extent, but then also it has its work. And so make sure you are choosing to do the work. It's not fair for you to show up to mentorship time and you've not done anything different from the time we met before. So make good use of the people you have relationships with in that space, um, but also be useful to them, right? Not just showing up with your handout, but hey, this is a thing I do. Can I, can I support your effort to do whatever? Making sure that we're bartering things when we can, but also just giving of ourselves in, in those ways. I think the other thing is to be intentional to build a community of clinicians if you're going to do this work, because this work is amazing and it's rewarding and it's hard at times, especially seasons like this where it's just a hundred different things coming at everybody because it's not like this is a space where I'm not affected by anything that's happening in 2020 mm -hmm. even good. if my life is not on fire right <laughs> like because sometimes my life is on fire and life is happening in the world and so then we're like whoa but even if my life is not on fire 
I'm experiencing COVID. I'm experiencing the police brutality in the news and I'm experiencing those things and it's affecting me. And so then to have clients on the other side of the screen talking to me about those same things, it can be a lot. And so it's super important that we are intentional about self-care. We say that a lot, it's a buzzword, but it really is about taking care of this vessel that's gonna do any of the work that adds value to the world. We cannot do it empty we cannot do it depleted or drained or you know we have to refuel we have to refill we have to restore ourselves so we can pour out and we've got to figure out what are those avenues that we seek to refill ourselves maybe it's faith maybe it's spirituality maybe it's again eating right sleeping working out exercising being with friends going outdoors for walks enjoying nature all these variety of different things, wellness things, yoga and aromatherapy and Reiki and a hundred other different things you might do. But being intentional to take care of this vessel because this is what does the work. Even if somebody else can do what you do, they don't do it the way you do it. And so you've got to be able to show up in the fullness of who you are so that you can do the amazing work you've been charged to do. And how do you, since people are quarantined, I know couples, um, you know, parents, kids, how do you carve out that time? Just, just schedule it. Just, mm -hmm. um, you know, I know some people are just, the longer that they're in, they're just kind of starting to be more anxious and mm -hmm. more mm -hmm. worrisome. And, mm -hmm. sure. um, mm -hmm. It's tricky. I will say that it's tricky. That's the start of the answer is that it's tricky. I think the second thing is that we have to, it's an opportunity, not we have to, it's an opportunity to, to prioritize self. And that's not selfish. I know that's not common nomenclature that we can choose ourselves and then not be selfish. But um, I have a five-year-old little girl. You may hear her in the, in the, in the background at points and times. Um, and I've had to say to her that mommy needs to do something that's just for mommy. And so that means you can't come. And so it might just be a walk around the block. It might be I'm going to sit in the car and listen to music by myself. It might be that I'm going to listen to this podcast alone in the room with the door closed. It might be that I'm going to take a shower for as long as I want. If I'm in there until the water gets cold, don't knock, I will come out for you. It is, you know, it's, it's taking a drive by yourself. It's doing whatever it is you know you need to do for you. And then if you're partnered, to try to initiate and support your partner's effort to do the same, right? To say, hey, okay, in the, and sometimes we have to schedule it, as you said. So we look at our calendar and we see, I found that if I really want time by myself consistently, I either have to wake up before everybody else or stay up after everybody especially because we're all home, we're working in the same space. So making sure that if I'm going to set an alarm to get up early, that then I have to be intentional to get to bed on time, whatever on time is for me, so that I can wake up and not hit the snooze and hit the snooze and then miss that time by myself and then be frustrated that I didn't have time by myself and so I'm snappy and I'm annoyed and overwhelmed because it's just too much, right? So really make Making sure that we prioritize on the front end if we can. But if you're more of a night owl, once kids are in bed, if you have children and once hubby or partner is away and doing their thing, to just kind of set this time and then be intentional to carve it out and to um, guard it with intentionality. If it's on your work calendar, I know some of us work in spaces, even with, when we're entrepreneurs, work in spaces where other people have access to our calendars. It's graying out some time that is just for me. And it's being very intentional, even if it can't happen every day, which is ideal a few times a week. Yeah, don't schedule me for Wednesday. I don't have it. Wednesday between 9 and 9.45, that's my time. Sometimes I will literally sit and watch the flicker of a candle. I will just sit and watch the candle burn. And I will listen to music, and that's the fragrance of the candle will fill the room. And I will just be in that space breathing and sitting. Sometimes I'm listening to a podcast. Sometimes I'm listening to a worship song or listening to other music that I enjoy. But it's really about commanding the moment. You notice in the meditation, I kept saying, in this moment. We don't get chunks of hours and a lot of time to do us stuff most of the time, especially not when the world is closed and we can't travel, right? So we have to make an opportunity, we have an opportunity to choose the moments that we have and to make the best of those moments. Oh, this has all been so good. I hope everybody's gotten some nuggets and some tools um, mm -hmm. to, to move forward. So um, how can people stay in touch with you? Yeah, so I am on Instagram and Facebook. The handle is Your Life's Well, which is the name of the practice. So it's Y O U R L I F. 
F is in Frank, E-S-W-E-L-L. -L. And then Erica St. Bernard, you can Google me and find me. I'm there um, and the practice is online. I have my social media is practice-based. And so I post things about what's going on in my world and in the work I do and all kinds of things to help us, again, seek wellness in all the ways it shows up in our life and our love and in the legacy we leave. Wonderful. Well, we are so uh, thankful and grateful to have you with us today. Um, we invite everybody to stay if they'd like to and hang out online for our virtual co-working session. Um, uh, it's best to win in gallery view, so it's just an opportunity if you'd like to stay and connect and co-work for a little bit, please feel free. Um, and then I just kind of want to share a couple of Walker's Legacy programming coming up. So tomorrow is our Girls Summit. We're really excited about this. We have some incredible young ladies that are business women that are killing it. Um, and so it's from 10 to 3. It's free. So mama, grandmas, aunties, if you have young ladies that are thinking about business or you want them to be business-minded, please have them tune in. And then we've got two phenomenal speakers for our Ask a Boss series. Um, it's just like a one-on-one -on -one with our CEO, uh, Natalie uh, Cofield. So on the 17th, we have the founder of The Honey Pot, B. Dixon. So she's phenomenal. And then we have Arlen Hamilton, um, the founder and managing partner of Backstage Capital on the 24th. So, and then always visit our website for uh, more details about our event. So Erica, thank you again. I hope everybody has some wonderful nuggets. We invite you to stay and hang out for co-working if you can. Yeah. And if not, have a wonderful day. Um, Thanks and so much. We'll see you next time.